six creepiest unsolved missing persons cases. 1. Harold Holt. On the gusty afternoon of December 17, 1967, a group of five adults arrived at Cheviot Beach, near Port City, Victoria, and strolled along the Bass Strait beneath the warm Australian sun. Harold Holt was eager for a swim, and after stepping behind a rock outcrop in the sand dunes, he emerged wearing a pair of blue swim trunks. Marjorie Gillespie and her daughter, Viner, both in bikinis, turned to the water and noticed that the surf, at high tide, was higher than they'd ever seen it. I know the speech like the back of my hand, Holt replied, and walked onto the surf without breaking his stride. Immediately, he began swimming away from the beach. Martin Simpson, Viner's boyfriend, followed but stopped when he was knee-deep in the surf. There was a fairly strong undercurrent, he said, so I just splashed around without going in too far. The third man in the group, Alan Stewart, told the others, if Mr. Holt can take it, I had better go in too. But he stopped quickly when he felt a tremendous undertow swirling around his legs. He watched Holt swim out into what he considered dangerous turbulence. Marjorie Gillespie had kept an eye on Holt as he swam further away, drifting from them until the water seemed to boil around him and he disappeared. Holt's four companions climbed a rocky cliff, and searched the water for traces of him. Finding none, they began to panic. Stewart went for help, and within minutes, three scuba divers were wading into the water. But the undertow was too strong even for them, and the currents made the water turbid and difficult to see in. They retreated from the surf, climbed a rock and scanned the water with binoculars until police and search and rescue teams arrived. Within an hour helicopters were hovering over the coast, and divers, tethered by safety ropes, were stepping into the churning sea. By sundown, nearly 200 personnel had arrived including rescuers from Australia's Army, Navy and Coast Guard, the Marine Board of Victoria and the Department of Air. The largest search and rescue operation in the nation's history was all for naught. Australia was paralysed by news of the unthinkable, Prime Minister Harold Holt was gone at the age of 59. Two days later, Holt was officially declared dead, and country party leader John McEwen was sworn in as Prime Minister. On December 22, a memorial service was held, attended by dignitaries including U.S. President Lyndon Johnson, Prince Charles of Wales and the presidents of South Vietnam and South Korea. But it did not take long for conspiracy theories to take hold of Australia's collective imagination. How could the country's leader simply disappear on the beach, in the company of just a few friends? Under the law, without the body, there could be no official inquest into Holt's disappearance. It wasn't until the Coroner's Act was signed into law in 1985, that the Coroner's Office was required to investigate its suspected deaths in the absence of a body, despite an extensive report made by the Commonwealth and Victoria Police, where eyewitness statements and search and rescue operations were recorded in detail. There were those who refused to believe that Holt, a reputed strong swimmer, had accidentally drowned. Just four years after the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy, the land down under had its own sweeping intrigue. Holt had spent more than three decades in Parliament and married to his University of Melbourne sweetheart, Zara Kate Dickens, but he had been Prime Minister less than two years when he disappeared. A few months after he had been sworn in, in January 1966, he had his defining moment in office, in a speech in Washington. D.C. Holt announced his support for the Vietnam War, declaring that Australia will be all the way with LBJ. Later that year, Holt agreed to increase Australian forces in Vietnam, and three quarters of a million people turned out to welcome President Johnson in Melbourne. There were also many war protesters who tossed paint at Johnson's car and chanted, LBJ, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Soon after Holt waded into the Bass Strait, speculation centered on his mental state at the time. People wondered whether, despondent over political pressures and the growing unpopularity with the Vietnam War, the Prime Minister committed suicide. It was also widely believed that Holt had been having an affair with Marjorie Gillespie. 
That much was true, Zara Holt's memoirs confirmed that he had had a number of extramarital affairs, and years later Gillespie acknowledged that she'd had a long relationship with him, rather than suicide, some suspected, Holt had merely faked his death so he could run away with his mistress. Over the years, the theories would only become more elaborate. Fifteen years after Holt's death, Ronald Titcombe, a former Australian naval officer, convinced the British novelist Anthony Gray that the Prime Minister had been working as a spy for the Chinese government since the early 1930s. Holt, Titcombe surmised, had been convinced that the Australian Secret Intelligence Service was on to him, on the day he was last seen. Holt simply swam out to sea and was picked up by a Chinese midget submarine. This theory was greeted with plenty of scoffing, and Zara Holt dismissed it famously years later, saying, Harry? Chinese submarine? He didn't even like Chinese cooking. The U.S. Central Intelligence Agency was not immune from speculation. Holt might have been rethinking his commitment to the Vietnam War, which was becoming increasingly unpopular in Australia. The CIA, this line of thinking went, had gotten him before he had a chance to withdraw his support. That Holt's death did not require a formal inquiry only added fuel to the theorizing that there had been a cover-up at the highest reaches of the Australian government. It wasn't until 2005 that the Victorian coroner opened just such an inquiry into Holt's disappearance. State coroner Graham Johnston found that Harold Holt had drowned at Cheviot Beach, and that his body had been either swept out to sea or taken by sharks. Cheviot Beach had long been perilous, countless shipwrecks had been documented in the vicinity over centuries, and the area had been cordoned off as a military zone. Holt had been given special permission to access the beach with his friends in privacy. Though he was an experienced swimmer, he had also been taking pain medications for a shoulder injury at the time and just six months earlier he had almost drowned at the same spot while snorkeling with friends. The coroner's report did not halt the conspiracy theories entirely, but it did provide support for a judgment first rendered by Lawrence Newell, the police inspector who investigated the case in 1967, and concluded that the cause of Holt's death was quite simple, overconfidence and a dangerous rip current. I think he went for a swim under conditions where he was most unwise, Newell said, and that's it. 2. Megumi Yokota For years, Japan saw kidnapping victim Megumi Yokota only as an innocent child, a fresh-faced junior high badminton player in school uniform, black hair framing her cheeks. Now for the first time, photographs are on display of Yokota's life after her 1977 abduction by North Korean spies, as she grew from a teenager into an adult imprisoned behind the reclusive regime's wall of secrecy. Three images of Yokota provided by North Korea, one as a sad-dyed teenager and two as a young woman, dominated front pages and talk shows this week, intensifying Japanese anguish and outrage over her abduction. We couldn't help crying when we saw the picture showing her worrying face looking directly at the camera, Megumi's mother, Seiki Yokota, tearfully told reporters. I don't know whom she wanted to appeal to. After being kidnapped and suffering in tears. One of 13 who disappeared. Megumi Yokota is among 13 Japanese citizens North Korea, has admitted kidnapping in the 1970s and 80s. Five were allowed to return to Japan in 2002, but North Korea has claimed, so far unconvincingly, that the others, including Yokota, are dead. Her age at the time of her kidnapping, 13, and the tireless efforts of her parents have turned Megumi Yokota into a symbol of Japanese indignation over the kidnappings, and a poster child for the campaign by abductees' families to win a full investigation into the fates of the victims. The families have called for sanctions against North Korea. But Prime Minister Junikiro Koizumi, under questioning in a parliament hearing, said he wants to keep the North Koreans engaged in hopes of making progress. There is still room for negotiations, he insisted Wednesday. We should make the effort, even if we can take only one or two steps ahead at a time. While the latest negotiations in the North Korean capital, Pyongyang, have not yielded what the Japanese hoped for, 
they did promise to shed faint light on Yokota's case. North produces a parent husband and daughter. The Japanese negotiators who returned from North Korea on Monday met with Kim Kiljun and Kim Hee Kyung, identified by Pyongyang as Yokota's husband and daughter. The negotiators also visited a hospital that supposedly treated Yokota and were given lengthy health records. In a heartbreaking turn, Kim Kiljun handed over an urn containing what the North says are Yokota's remains. Pyongyang claims she committed suicide in 1994, DNA identification is expected next week. But with North Korea's history of deception, bones it claimed in 2002 belonged to another abductee, for example, turned out to be someone else's, speculation has gone into overdrive about whether Yokota was being kept in the country ruled by Kim Jong-il. After years of mystery, the new photos are tantalizing. In the earlier picture, Yokota looks forlornly into the camera, wearing what experts say is a typical North Korean school uniform. In another, she poses, smiling slightly, well-dressed and apparently well-fed. The third photograph shows her standing next to a black car, with snow drifts behind her. Looking at these calmly, the pictures show her in neat clothing and wearing makeup, observed her father, Shigeru Yokota. I feel she possibly lived a relatively happy life. Analyzing the strange tale. Talk show panelists examined the photos in excruciating detail Wednesday, bringing out a drama professor who scrutinized Yokota's expressions for clues to her emotional state, and an auto expert who identified the car as a Mercedes. Media accounts have focused on inconsistencies in North Korean accounts of Yokota's death, changing dates alleged contradictions in hospital records and suspicions that, as an attractive young woman, she was associated too closely with North Korea's elite to be allowed to leave. I imagine she had been very close to Kim Jong-il. I hear people say she had been his teacher and so on, said Kaneko Tamiyama, a 51-year-old Tokyo woman. I think she was not allowed to return to Japan, because she knew too much about the North. The man identified as her husband also reportedly refused to provide hair and blood samples that would prove he fathered the girl identified as their daughter. Her family is still clinging to hope she is alive. I know that everything in that country is a lie, Yokota's mother said. I'm praying that the DNA tests on the remains will show they are not Megami's. 3. The Springfield 3. On June 7, 1992, Stacy McCall, Suzanne Susie Streeter, and Susie's mother Cheryl Lovett vanished from Lovett's home in an R, uh, of the 1700 block of E. Delmer Street in Springfield, Missouri. The three women's disappearances have haunted the families and remained a mystery for two decades. Cheryl Williams Lovett would have turned 47 years old on November 1st, following her disappearance. Her daughter, Susie had just turned 19 years old on March 9th. Prior to her disappearance, Stacy McCall had just turned 18 on April 23, 1992. All have been missing 25 years. Besset friends missing. Stacy and Susie had just graduated from Kickapoo High School on Saturday, June 6, 1992. The two young women had been at a graduation party at another friend's home, at approximately 2 a.m. on June 7. Initially the pair had planned to spend the night at a hotel, then at a friend's home in Battlefield but left because the house was crowded with out-of-town guests. They departed in their own separate vehicles, and headed to Susie's home to spend the night with her mother Cheryl. It is believed the two young women arrived at Cheryl's home at approximately 2.15 a.m., and had planned to go to Whitewater Amusement Park the flowing afternoon. After Susie and Stacy arrived at the residence, the trail follows twists and turns into darkness of the unknown. The last contact Cheryl had with anyone was at approximately 11.15 p.m. on the evening of June 6, 1992, when she had talked to a friend about refinishing and painting a dresser. Cheryl had been a single mother, described as being very close to her daughter and a successful hairdresser at a local salon. The flowing afternoon. Friends went to Cheryl's home to meet Susie and Stacy as planned, then head to the amusement park but no one answered the door. The friends observed the woman's vehicles parked in the driveway, 
and noticed the porch light still illuminated, but the glass globe covering the bulb had been broken, and there was shattered glass on the front porch. The friends cleaned up the glass on the porch and proceeded to enter the home through the unlocked front door, not realizing they were entering a crime scene. Confusion sets in. At first, friends thought maybe the woman had gone for a walk. Later that day when the three women failed to arrive back at their home, a friend called Stacy's mother, Janice McCall. Janice had not known Stacy had spent the night at Susie's home thinking she would be staying in Battlefield overnight. Stacy had last talked to her mother the night before when she called at about 10.30 p.m. on June 6, informing Janice she would be staying in Battlefield. After receiving the call from one of the girl's friends that had been to the home, Stacy's mother went to Cheryl's home and later called police to report the three missing. When investigators arrived, they do not observe any sign of foul play or a struggle within the home. In fact, all of the women's personal belongings including keys, makeup, purses, and clothing, were still inside the residence. The family dog, a Yorkie named Cinnamon, was anxiously running around inside the home and police noted the blinds inside the home were apart, as if someone had been peeking through looking outside during the night. It appeared Cheryl had been in bed watching television, her glasses, and book on the nightstand, and cigarettes along with her lighter still in the home. Aside from the shattered globe on the porch, the glass discarded before it was determined it could have been a key piece of evidence, no additional evidence was found as the home that indicated foul play. Several searches of the surrounding area turned up nothing. It seemed like the three women had simply vaporized. Following the women's disappearances, police followed up on leads, interviewed individuals who had attended the party the previous evening, as well as relatives, friends, even boyfriends. One witness reported seeing a green Dodge van in the area but police were unable to identify the vehicle or owner. Several callers provided tips indicating the woman may be buried at a local hospital parking structure prior to a concrete pour. Even Susie's older brother, Bart Streeter, has remained on the list of suspects. The story appeared on several national TV shows including Unsolved Mysteries, 48 Hours and America's Most Wanted, AMW. A male tipster called into AMW on New Year's Eve in 1993, but disconnected when the operator attempted to patch the call through to Springfield Police Department. Investigators believe the individual had intimate knowledge of the circumstances surrounding the three women's disappearance. Mother's nightmare continues for decades. Stacy's mother, Janice McCall has never given up hope she will find her daughter alive. Like other parents who search for their missing child, giving up hope is not an option. Following her daughter's disappearance, Janice founded One Missing Link, a non-profit organization that helps other families search for their missing loved ones. Recalling the last time she saw her daughter, Janice said, The last thing I said to Stacy was that I love her, thank goodness. Janice said Stacy said she loved them and promised to call later. After the graduation they had taken pictures and had asked Stacy if she wanted to eat her graduation cake but Stacy declined and said, Don't cut it until I get back tomorrow. When a loved one is missing, family members suffer incredible turmoil in the aftermath of the disappearance. They replay the last time they saw their loved one, what they could have said, what they should have said. Is their loved one suffering? Are they injured and in a hospital? Is someone keeping them? Do they need rescue? The mind takes on a life of its own constantly revisiting their last minutes of contact. Experts agree ambiguous loss is the most traumatic psychological experience a person can endure, while existing in what seems a never-ending life of limbo. In the meantime, this incredibly courageous mother, with the strength of an entire lion pride continues searching for her beloved daughter. To Janice, if there was even a small chance her daughter Stacy McCall, Susie Streeter and Cheryl Lovett are still alive, giving up is never an option. Janice told Discovery ID, if there is one tenth, one hundredth of one percent of a chance I can find her, I want that, I want to find her. I want her to know how very much she means to us.
one can look into this mother's eyes and never fully comprehend what the last 20 years has been like. When I asked Janice if there was anything she wished she would have said to Stacy the last night she saw her, Janice says, I wish I had told her she couldn't go anywhere that night but that is a little unrealistic. If I had only known what I know now. 4. Robin Gardner These are the last photographs of missing Maryland woman Robin Gardner taken hours before she went missing from Aruba, allegedly after going snorkeling with the man who was suspected of killing her, after reading a text she sent to her boyfriend telling him she loved him. Aruba prosecutors released the photographs on Wednesday, to help aid potential witnesses on the Dutch Caribbean island, and detained Gary Giordano, 50, for another day. Previously released pictures yielded little results, according to officials. Two pictures of Robin wearing her favorite dress were taken as she left a restaurant on the afternoon she went missing. In one photo, Giordano's back is also visible as they depart the Rum Reef restaurant. Prosecutors also released a photo of the white Toyota RAV4 that the two rented on the island. Meanwhile, it has been reported that police believe the 50-year-old businessman killed the 35-year-old dental assistant after becoming jealous when he read a message she sent to her boyfriend back home saying, I love you. The sudden moment of anger is said to have spoiled a premeditated plan he had made to murder Robin and dump her body at sea in an attempt to cover his tracks, according to the National Enquirer. It is thought that Giordano was trying to collect the $1.5 million accidental death policy but slipped up, leading to his arrest. Sources said police are considering the theory that the suspect was obsessed with the 2005 death of Natalie Holloway, a teenager from Alabama, and the subsequent failure of police to convict Jaren Van Der Stel of killing her. Cops think Giordano believed that Jaren dumped Natalie's body at sea, and he was planning to do the same thing, a source said. Robin, who met Giordano online, is not thought to have had a physical relationship with him. She was dating another man, Richard Forrester, at the time but traveled with Giordano, 50, to Aruba after the relationship was said to have hit some stumbling blocks. Police are said to believe that on the day of her disappearance, Robin sent a text to her boyfriend, which read, I love you. I care about you. We'll sort this out when I get back. Police believe that Giordano, who by now was fantasizing that Robin was in love with him, saw the messages on her iPad and went berserk with jealousy, a source told the Enquirer. He became furious because he'd paid for their trip and she was sending romantic texts to another guy. After eating lunch, the two were spotted by a fisherman walking around the reef behind the restaurant before getting into a car. Police believe Giordano drove Robin to a nearby area called Cerro Colorado, and either strangled beat her or tortured her to death after he dragged her into one of 50 abandoned shacks that used to house workers from a once bustling oil refinery, the source added. Later in the afternoon, Giordano returned to the restaurant, where they ate lunch and reported her missing, saying they had just been snorkeling. The fresh allegations come as an employee at the restaurant said he thought it odd that Robin would have been going snorkeling that day due to the clothes she was wearing and the way her hair and makeup were done. Other eyewitnesses said she seemed woozy, and did not touch her salad when she ate in the rum reef bar, and grill with the man suspected of killing her. A picture of the 35-year-old obtained by ABC shows her leaving the restaurant in her favorite dress, according to her family. The time the picture was taken was 4.12 p.m., less than two hours before Giordano, 50, reported her missing. The picture has emerged at the same time a close friend of Robin said, that she did not just pack up and go to Aruba with the man she barely knew, but she had actually known him for years after meeting him on dating website Match.com. Leanne Delauder said, their relationship spanned back a long way, they'd known each for a couple of years. They met on Match.com and went on a date but it didn't work out and they stayed friends. It wasn't a date date. They were never seeing each other, she told Radar Online. It was initially believed that the pair recently met on an internet site and that Giordano paid the pretty blonde to go away with him. Miss Stillotter added, 
She wasn't the type of girl to go away with someone she didn't know at all. She was very trusting and always saw the good in someone, saw light where there was darkness, but she wasn't naive. They were just going as friends. She also revealed that Robin lied to her live-in boyfriend Richard Forrester about where she was going, telling him she was off on a family vacation to Orlando rather than Aruba. Her roommate claimed that the businessman invited her on a cruise earlier this year, and became very angry when Robin cancelled on him, according to Radar. She said she was worried when she heard her Robin had agreed to go away with him, and has no doubt Giordano was involved in her disappearance. As the 50-year-old is held for another day, his story regarding what happened the day Robin disappeared is being cast into doubt as another witness said, he saw the pair walking along the jetty when they were supposed to be snorkeling. He claims they then drove off in a white rental car shortly after 4 p.m. The fisherman claims the pair never went into the ocean, and that after they drove off, he did not see them for the rest of the day. The new evidence came as another woman said that Giordano had told her that he could make her disappear without a trace after she rejected his proposal to take her teen model daughter to Aruba. Giordano allegedly telephoned Carrie Emerson claiming to be a producer in late July, after seeing pictures of her daughter on the internet and told her that he wanted to take her 18-year-old daughter to the island for a swimwear photo shoot. He made the offer sound so wonderful that anyone needing the money or the modeling job would have gone, she told Fox News. Thankfully it was me who answered the phone and not my daughter. During the conversation, he told me that he could make me disappear and no one would ever look for me. Also speaking on Fox News, the Aruba Solicitor General Taco Stein last night denied reports that a blood handprint had been found on a rock near where Giordano was last seen with M's gardener. The detail about the handprint and blood is not true, he said. That is not something that we have found, adding, let me put that to rest as that only hinders the investigation. Meanwhile, graphic, disturbing and beyond pornographic images are believed to have been found on Giordano's camera of M's gardener, calling into question the relationships between the pair, who were at first believed to simply be traveling companions. Giordano's camera as well as his laptop and cell phone, have been sent away for analysis. Solicitor General of Aruba Taco Stein, who called the 50-year-old a mean bee, could not confirm the nature of the images to the Today Show but would only say it did not look like she was under any duress. Meanwhile it emerged that the Maryland businessman tried to collect the $1.5 million accidental death policy he took out on her just two days after he reported her disappearance to police. Giordano, who purchased the accidental policy shortly, before traveling to the Dutch Caribbean island with a 35-year-old, tried to begin redeeming the American Express policy, which he took out just days before their trip and unusually only covered the trip to Aruba. According to a police source, Giordano purchased a more expensive one-year policy instead of a more commonly purchased five-year policy. Giordano, a twice-divorced father of three, is still fighting the accusations and is being held in an Arabian prison. He still denies anything to do with Robin's disappearance and claims she vanished while they were out snorkeling. Police are looking at a rock which is said to have a full handprint and blood on it that was found behind a restaurant that the pair were said to have dined in before her disappearance. On Monday Giordano was ordered to remain in an Arabian jail for another 16 days while police investigate serious inconsistencies in his account of events. The American Express accidental policy is currently being investigated by the FBI. Court documents show the 50-year-old has a history of domestic violence, has not been charged but remains the only suspect in the case. His attorney has said he had nothing to do with her disappearance, and has called for his release from Gowell. Officers having been tracing the movements of Giordano in the hours before Rems Gardner's disappearance, but said they have had trouble identifying him in surveillance video because he frequently changes his toupees. Video shows the pair at the rum beef bar and grill in the Baby Beach area of the island where Rems Gardner went missing. Restaurant staff have told investigators that the woman seemed woozy while they ate. 
Surveillance footage also shows Giordano in his rental car at the back of the restaurant, but the car had tinted windows so no one else in the vehicle can be seen. Police said that they found blood on a rock behind the dive shop at the restaurant. 5. Percy Fawcett Since Europeans first arrived in the New World, there have been stories of a legendary jungle city of gold, sometimes referred to as El Dorado. Spanish conquistador, Francisco de Orellana was the first to venture along the Rio Negro in search of this fabled city. In 1925, at the age of 58, explorer Percy Fawcett headed into the jungles of Brazil to find a mysterious lost city he called Z. He and his team would vanish without a trace, and the story would turn out be one of the biggest news stories of his day. Despite countless rescue missions, Fawcett was never found. Was he killed by Amazonian tribesmen? And is there any factual basis for his lost city of Z? Colonel Percy Harrison Fawcett was born in England in 1867, and was a famous British explorer whose legendary adventures captivated the world. An officer in the army and trained surveyor, Fawcett was the last of the great territorial explorers, men who ventured into blank spots on the map with little more than a machete and a compass. For years he would survive without contact in the wilderness, and befriend tribes who had never before seen a white man. His exploits in the Amazon inspired books and Hollywood movies, Indiana Jones is purportedly based on Fawcett. The Amazon wilderness is about the size of the continental United States and during Fawcett's time, it remained one of the last unexplored regions on the map. In 1906, the Royal Geographical Society, a British organization that sponsors scientific expeditions, invited Fawcett to survey part of the frontier between Brazil and Bolivia. He spent 18 months in the Mato Grosso area and it was during his various expeditions, that Fawcett became obsessed with the idea of lost civilizations in this area. Fawcett describes the city of Z. Fawcett formulated theories of a city he called Z in 1912. His conviction was fueled in part by the rediscovery of the lost Inca city of Machu Picchu, in 1911, hidden away in Peru's Andes Mountains. During his travels, Fawcett also heard rumors of a secret city buried in the jungles of Chile, that was said to have streets paved in silver and roofs made of gold. Of Z itself, Fawcett had a specific idea of what the city looked like. In a letter to his son Brian, Fawcett wrote, I expect the ruins to be monolithic in character, more ancient than the oldest Egyptian discoveries. Judging by inscriptions found in many parts of Brazil, the inhabitants used an alphabetical writing ally to many ancient European and Asian scripts. There are rumors, too, of a strange source of light in the buildings, a phenomenon that filled with terror the Indians who claimed to have seen it. The central place I call Z, our main objective, is in a valley surmounted by lofty mountains. The valley is about 10 miles wide, and the city is on an eminence in the middle of it, approached by a barreled roadway of stone. The houses are low and windowless, and there is a pyramidal temple. The inhabitants of the place are fairly numerous, they keep domestic animals, and they have well-developed mines in the surrounding hills. Not far away is a second town, but the people living in it are of an inferior order to those of Z. Farther to the south is another large city, half buried and completely destroyed. Manuscript 512. In 1920, Fawcett came across a document in the National Library of Rio de Janeiro called Manuscript 512. It was written by a Portuguese explorer in 1753, who claimed to have found a walled city deep in the Mato Grosso region of the Amazon rainforest, reminiscent of ancient Greece. The manuscript described the lost, silver-laden city with multi-storied buildings, soaring stone arches, wide streets leading down towards a lake on which the explorer had seen two white Indians in a canoe. On the sides of a building were carved letters that seemed to resemble a Greek or an early European alphabet. These claims were dismissed by archaeologists who believed the jungles could not hold such large cities, but for Fawcett, it all came together. 6. Mora Murray 
It was a cold February day in 2004, when UMass Amherst student Maura Murray took a spontaneous trip toward the White Mountains. She told no one where she was going when she emptied her bank account, packed up her things, and hit the road. Just as quickly as her road trip started, it abruptly came to an end that evening when Murray crashed her car on a rural New Hampshire street. She has never been seen again. Murray's car was found abandoned on February 9, 2004 in Haverhill, New Hampshire by state police responding to a call by a concerned bus driver. The bus driver came upon the crash, and a seemingly uninjured Murray told him she had called AAA, even though she hadn't, and didn't need his help. The driver left the accident and alerted police when he got home. When police arrived to the scene minutes later, they found the wrecked vehicle, but no sign of the driver. The car's windshield was cracked, the airbags were deployed, the doors were locked, and a box of wine was spilled across the car seat. All of Murray's belongings, except for her debit cards and cell phone, were in the vehicle, and a rag was stuffed inside of the tailpipe. The peculiar scene conjured up many questions. What happened, and why? And where was Murray? Twelve years later, authorities still haven't been able to answer those questions. Before the accident, Murray's disappearance has captivated many across the web spawning endless discussion on her life and what could have happened to her. Did the young woman walk off into the woods and freeze to death? Or, did her bad luck continue that night and lead her into the car of a killer? In order to find answers, internet detectives have analyzed the 21-year-old's personal life. In the months before the accident, Murray was arrested for credit card fraud. She was on probation for the incident when she disappeared and she also experienced an emotional breakdown while at work days before. Two days before the accident, Murray's father, Fred, visited her on campus. The two shopped around for used cars together, before Murray borrowed her father's car to party with friends. Later that evening, an inebriated Murray decided to return the car to her father and got into an accident. Murray managed to escape being arrested by police, but the event upset her. Her father said Murray felt as though she let him down. Fred left Amherst on February 8. He spoke with his daughter around 11.30 p.m. on the phone that night to arrange to fix his car on the following Monday. As it turned out, his wrecked car would be the least of his worries. The accident and disappearance. On the day of her disappearance, Murray emailed her professors and told them she was taking a week off of school for a family emergency. In actuality, there was no family emergency. As well as the emails, she searched for directions to the Berkshires in Burlington, Vermont. She also researched condos in the New Hampshire area. A resident heard Murray crash outside her house at 7 p.m. and reported the accident by 7.30 p.m. The bus driver reported the accident around 7.43 p.m and the police arrived at 7.46 p.m., when she couldn't be found that night. The authorities placed the BOLOB on the lookout for Murray the following day. Her family and boyfriend arrived in Haverhill on February 11, and a search was done by New Hampshire Fish and Game, two days after her disappearance. The search yielded no evidence or sign of Murray. The Investigation As a part of the investigation, Murray's family and boyfriend were interviewed by police. Her boyfriend, Billy, told them he received a voicemail, that has since been deleted, on the night of the accident that sounded like Murray crying. Police were not able to determine if the call was actually from Murray. At the initial time of her disappearance, police explored multiple scenarios as to what happened to the nursing student. One possibility was that she had committed suicide, but police concluded, it was unlikely based on information family had given to them about Murray's state of mind at the time. She was doing well in school, and didn't have anything truly disrupting her life, that they knew of. Authorities also entertained the idea that Murray walked away from the scene, was picked up by a passerby, dropped off at a bus station and fled the area. Along with that idea, Another theory speculated Murray was intoxicated when she crashed and she wanted to avoid getting into trouble. 
police explained the theory in a Boston newspaper. Second unlikeliest is that, intoxicated, she ventured into the woods and was overcome by the elements. But dogs couldn't trace her scent, there were no footprints in the fresh snow, and helicopters equipped with heat-seeking devices were no help. The case grew even more strange when another young woman went missing a month later. Brianna Maitland's car was found crashed and abandoned outside of Vermont farmhouse, 100 miles away from the scene of Murray's crash. Like Murray, Maitland has never been found. The eerie similarities between the cases prompted some to believe there was a connection between the two, however, police have never confirmed the cases are related. What seemed like a possible lead in Murray's case turned into nothing. It was almost as if Murray vanished into thin air. With no trace of the missing woman, the case went cold. Leads in the case. With the widespread attention of Renner's blog, and Murray's case, came new tips and leads. On the 8th anniversary of Murray's disappearance, videos were uploaded to YouTube from a man, who claimed to know information about her whereabouts. In one video, titled, Happy Anniversary, user 112 Dirtbag is just laughing maniacally into the camera for a full minute as his one tooth glistens against the glare of the screen. At the end of his taunting laughter, the mystery man winks at the camera. In another post, the creep shows pictures of a map to a nearby ski lodge, suggesting it's the location of Murray's body. However, upon further investigation it was determined to be a false lead. And while the videos are unsettling, the man has been written off as a mentally unstable person obsessed with the case. In company with haunting videos claiming to know what happened to Murray, various settings have been reported over the years. The most recent setting came near the 12th anniversary of her disappearance. In February 2016, a flight attendant reported seeing Murray in Quebec. She recorded a video of the sighting, and police are reportedly examining it. Mora is still missing. Despite the national attention, and endless online debate the case has received, investigators haven't come any closer to finding more Murray. Many online believe the troubled young woman did walk off into the woods, and her bones are burrowed in the dirt, waiting to be rescued from their makeshift grave. Murray's father believes his daughter was abducted that night, and doesn't want to give up hope in finding her. As a family grieves the loss of their little girl, and tries to overcome the dread of not knowing what happened to her, the rest of the world goes on. We don't know what happened that night, and we can't assume to know what she was thinking, or let her past mistakes determine her fate. Maura Murray crashed her car on February 9, 2004, and she needs to be found. All we can do now is hope that she'll be brought home.